Hey, I'm John and I'm a terrible student. Anything in any of my subjects that I don't find interesting is just immediately ignored when it comes to revision, so I just cover the topics I like. Obviously this is fucking stupid. It doesn't matter whether I find it interesting, I need to know it. So I did what any other terrible student would do, and I looked up on YouTube because I don't want to read about this bollocks. I'll just get some attractive person to tell me about it while I half pay attention, probably on Twitter or something, hoping it sinks in subconsciously. And while I like SciShow and Crash Course a lot, they can't really help that much with British A-levels because they have their own batshit way of doing school over in America, and theirs is quite different. So I decided to do it myself for the benefit of all of you. I mean, I'm actually doing this for my own benefit. I get to write my notes out in a script and then read them out to an imaginary audience for meaningless numbers of web page. Anyway, enough self-loathing, time to get started. And just a quick disclaimer, this is not in any way meant to replace revision. Just because I'm incapable of it doesn't mean that you are as well. This is meant as a mildly entertaining way to cover the very basics. Watch these videos and do nothing else and you'll barely scrape a pass. Like me. Anyway, first up is On the Wild Side from Biology. So this one is on the environment and bollocks like that, but it has its moments, mainly the pictures of the polar bears. So we've got abiotic and biotic factors which affect populations, how ecosystems are always changing, that wonderfully dull area of succession, and the main reason life as we know it exists, photosynthesis. So. Ecosystems, the boring part of biology, the part where you have to use quadrats and moisture detectors. First things first, what is the definition of an ecosystem? Well, why don't you try and shout out the answer at your screen at home? Just kidding, this isn't fucking Dora the Explorer. Ecosystems are biological communities, including the organisms living there and the physical environment in which the organisms live. But John, what determines the kind of species that proliferate there? Where have you Shut up, bitch, I was just getting to that. Ecosystems are usually governed by the two biggest factors since the X, abiotic factors and biotic factors. So, what the fuck are they then? Abiotic factors. So, these are the factors that aren't due to living creatures. For instance, solar energy input, which couldn't give a single shit to what algae in a pond would want, the climate, which doesn't give a toss about Mr. Leopard's life, and topography, which actually does care. Just kidding, you're a fleeting speck of dust of the mountains. And then, of course, there are biotic factors. These are the ones caused by living beings, which actually do give a shit, sometimes literally. So, for instance, grazing, disease, parasitism, all that jazz, competition, that's the big boy. All of these are usually density dependent. Biotic factors affect organisms, but they also in turn affect biotic factors. It's like a circular human centipede. So, we know what abiotic and biotic factors are, so you can kind of assume the effect that they have on the kind of community that arises. If there are plants that are only grown relatively moist, 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 moist conditions, a sudden heat wave caused by the inevitable climate change humans are creating by being massive dicks will cause those plants to die. These plants dying means that herbivores grazing on them will also begin to die out, which then causes secondary consumers to die out, or because you insist on having a stable source of electricity to watch YouTube videos instead of doing actual revision. I hope you're happy with yourself. But if you put aside the fact that you're personally causing all of these deaths, they were all caused by the abiotic factor of the heat wave. However, the primary and secondary consumers weren't personally killed by the abiotic factor, but rather the biotic factor of the lack of things to graze and the lack of things to kill and consume. So to conclude, shit goes down in an ecosystem when an abiotic change occurs, causing a biotic change, causing the Pride Lands when Scar is in charge, please don't sue me, Disney. So, now that we've got how everyone and everything will die because of humans out of the way, let's find out how everything got the way it was before we fucked it up. In order to help with the idea of how succession works, let's use an actual example from real life, Surtsey Island. It's an island that formed in the 80s due to an underwater volcanic eruption. It's pretty fucking dope. Anyway, when there's bare ground, how the hell do new plants and stuff grow on there? Well, here's how the hell new plants and stuff grow on there. So, it starts with the pioneer species, represented here by an algae wearing one of those raccoon skin hats. These are the first organisms on the scene, the ones that can cope with extreme abiotic factors, high or low temperatures, lack of soil, water, and nutrients. These algae and lichens are hardcore, none of that pussy rose shit where they only bloom in soil between 7.4 and 7.6 pH. These guys begin to break down the rocks, and their organic matter mixes with this broken down rock to form the beginnings of soil. Moss and other shit begins to spread, which means that the soil is capable of holding water. Now it's time for other species to come in and lay their roots in the soil the pioneers have made, taking all of their credit like a bunch of pricks. Seeds from the shallow rooted plants blow over on the wind or get washed over or get shot out by birds and begin to germinate in that sweet sweet soil from the pioneers. These grow, spread and die setting up an area and better conditions for taller and deeper rooted plants and eventually a climax community forms. These are usually dominated by trees making forests. The best example I can think of is a citrus tree. 
but they can be a little bit picky about where they grow. So if you want to see an example of a climax community, go to lemonparty.org. Then there's the whole question of how animals get onto there, but that's complicated and you don't need to know that, so fuck it if you're interested, Google it. But what if some jackass bolt of lightning sets a tree on fire and that spreads, causing all kinds of chaos? Well, another climax community arises. Give it some time though, it still needs to recover from the first climax. Bare ground doesn't usually stay bare for long. Seeds that have remained underground, not germinating during the previous community, have their time to shine, germinating and growing in the corpses of their previous competition, like a super fucked up version of Tortoise and the Hare. Then there are completely new species that come over the same way as the old ones. It just builds and develops into a lovely multicultural hub, with the old trees on the other side of the forest and sisters ruining the island with their confusing pollination techniques and different colour patterns. So, now that we've covered how plants get where they are, let's talk about what they do all day, standing around like a bunch of punks. It's photosynthesis time, and we're getting right into the nitty gritty. By the way, did you know that the term nitty gritty comes from the slave trade? When slaves were being transported, their waste would collect at the bottom of the boat, and this section was called the nitty gritty, probably as a play on words of the n-word. I mean, this is disputed by a bunch of people suffering from guilt about the fact that their ancestors took part in the slave trade, but I don't have time for white guilt, I have enough of it from the crimes I've committed. So, back to photosynthesis. Up until this point, you've probably just seen photosynthesis as this. You slap in some carbon dioxide and water, light does something with chlorophyll, and then bingo, you've got glucose and oxygen coming out at the end, it's as easy as that. But no, it's not as easy as that. There's something with chlorophyll needs to be known at this point, and it's kind of confused. At least it didn't do what GCSE chemistry teachers did and straight up lie to you about what an atom structure is like. Yeah, it's not just a nucleus with electrons orbiting around in perfect little circles, but I dropped chemistry in my lower sixth year, so if you want to find out more, then go to school, you fucking nerd. Anyway, photosynthesis. This splits into two little subsets, light-dependent reactions and light-independent reactions. Wait, there's a part of photosynthesis that doesn't require- Listen, if you don't shut the fuck up, we'll never be able to finish this. That's not fair, you just went off on a thing about nitty Yes, I did, but it's also my show, so I can do what I want, so why don't you make like a tree and piss off? Fine. Like, fuck for that. Anyway, back to photosynthesis. So, first we had the light-dependent reactions, which take place in the chloroplasts, more specifically in the thylakoid, and even more specifically in these two kinds of pigment molecules called photosystems. Helpfully nicknamed PSI and PSII, or PS1 and PS2, depending on if you're in a private school. So light is absorbed by PS1 and PS2, causing two of their electrons to rise to a higher energy level. These molecules are now referred to as excited, and the electrons leave the molecules and pass along a series of electron carrier molecules, all of which are embedded in the thylakoid membranes. As they're being passed along, they are letting out energy. The ones from PS1 are off on their own thing, which we'll be coming back to in a minute, but for now we'll focus on PS2. PS2's electrons also go down the electron transfer to the PS1 molecule, replacing the ones that were lost and releasing energy along the way, which is used to make ATP through the process of photophosphorylation. It's a very hard fucking word to say. Photophosphorylation. 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 Where? Fuck it. Anyway, it's where an inorganic phosphate from the water in the thylakoid is added to ADP to then create ATP. But wait, we need more electrons than the PS2 one now, right? So where, where are they, are they coming, coming from? What did I just fucking say? Uh, like you need someone there, just like a call and response kind of. <laughs> okay. The electrons are replaced in PS2 by splitting water in the thylakoid. Enzymes perform photolysis. That's not right. Enzymes perform photolysis. It's photolysis. Light then provides the energy to help the enzymes split the water into its component parts. Oxygen gas, which is then released as a waste product, hydrogen ions that remain inside of the thylakoid, and electrons that are then passed on to the PS2 molecule. Okay, now that's out of the way, back to what that PS1 molecule was doing with those electrons we gave it. Within the thylakoid space there is a coenzyme known as the NADP. This combines with the electrons from PS1 and the hydrogen ions from the photolysis to become reduced NADP. This joins forces with the ATP from the phos from the photophosphorylation. That's not the right word, but fuck it. Um, from before, which both come over to the stroma to produce glucose with the big boys, and so begins our foray into light-independent reactions. Just something mildly interesting. The fact oxygen is released before CO2 becomes part of the cycle means that plants don't really convert CO2 into oxygen. They convert water into oxygen and then just coincidentally also absorb CO2. Anyway, back to the shit that you actually need to pay attention to. This is where it actually gets incredibly boring. I mean, it wasn't setting fire to your pubes before, but I'll be putting up pictures of dogs in between steps to keep your attention. So, 
Step 1. Carbon dioxide comes on the scene and combines with the 5-carbon compound ribulose biphosphate, or RUBP, because I cannot be asked to say that. This reaction is catalyzed with the enzyme ribulose biphosphate carboxylase, or Ribisco. There's a dog. The 6-carbon compound it makes is unstable, so it immediately breaks down, like my self-confidence following an insult, and it forms two 3-carbon molecules, glycerate 3-phosphate, or GP. Another dog. GP is then reduced to form a 3-carbon sugar phosphate called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or GALP. The hydrogen in this reduction comes from the reduced NADP from before, and also the ATP from earlier makes an appearance to provide the energy for the reaction. Here's another dog, we're getting close. Two out of every 12 GALPs are then used to create the 6-carbon sugar hexose, which can be converted into other organic compounds. The other 10 are used to create RUBP. That's right, it's all connected, bitches. The GALPs rearrange into six 5-carbon compounds, which are then phosphorylized into ATP to form RUBP. It's all a cycle, named after this guy, Calvin. So, there you go, you have the building blocks of glucose. Photosynthesis is done. So, now that we're done with photosynthesis, that means we're done with everything in this topic. Well, I mean, there's climate change and shit, but that's just saying, yeah, it's real, over and over again for like 15 marks. So, concluding. We know about abiotic and biotic factors, how algae are heroes who pave the way for all other life, and how photosynthesis works. So, until next time, depending on how this is received and whether I can be asked, this is goodbye from me. Any nice and helpful comments will be appreciated, and anything resembling criticism will make me cry. Okay, see ya.